Hello class, in this video we will be looking at fuel cells, learn how they work to supply energy, and examine the differences between fuel cells and a galvanic cell. In the previous video we've learned that batteries can be classified as primary or secondary cells. Primary cells are non-rechargeable by nature and are to be disposed of once the battery is dead. In contrast, secondary cells are defined as rechargeable cells and can be discharged and recharged multiple times. However, there is another type of battery that operates in a different way compared to primary cells and secondary cells called fuel cells. The most common fuel cell is the hydrogen fuel cell, which is a type that we'll be focusing on in this video. A fuel cell is a type of a galvanic cell, which means it uses redox reactions to convert chemical energy into electrical energy, but is different from a primary and a secondary cell because the battery doesn't get flat over time, nor do they need to be recharged. Depending on the type of fuel cell, it will use the chemical energy stored in the bonds of fuels, such as hydrogen, to cleanly and efficiently produce electricity compared to thermal power stations that uses fossil fuels. The reason why it can constantly generate electricity is because it receives a continuous supply of fuel, which is illustrated in the diagram below, where you can see a constant amount of hydrogen and oxygen that's being pumped into the fuel cell to take part of the redox reaction. Let's closely inspect the design features of the hydrogen fuel cell. A fuel cell contains two gas compartments found on either side, one which receives hydrogen and the other which receives oxygen. Because both reactants are in the gaseous state, porous carbon electrodes are used and together with the electrolyte solution, this helps separate the sites of oxidation and reduction. If you take a closer look at the both diagrams, you can also see that both of the electrodes are also coated with a catalyst to improve the efficiency of the reaction. Like a galvanic cell, the site of reduction occurs at the cathode, which is a positively charged electrode, and the site of oxidation occurs at the anode, which is a negatively charged electrode. Now that we've covered the basic structure, let's look at how it functions in more detail. Hydrogen gas is pumped into the fuel where the anode resides where it gets oxidized. The oxidation of hydrogen gas produces hydrogen ions as shown in the oxidation half equation. These free moving hydrogen ions are able to pass through the electrolyte solution or the proton exchange membrane and the H plus ions diffuse across in the direction towards the cathode. The electrons that were released and produced from the oxidation reaction are transported along through the electrical circuit towards the cathode. The movement of these electrons can thus be harnessed to provide electrical energy to a device. On the opposite compartment, the oxygen molecules present in air enters the cathode which is the site of reduction. At the cathode, the hydrogen ions gets reunited with the electrons it lost and together with the oxygen molecule, reacts in a manner to produce water vapour and heat which can be represented by the following half equation. There's one key thing that I would like to address in order for this process to work properly which is the nature of the electrolyte solution. The electrolyte solution is specifically made to selectively allow the diffusion of hydrogen ions to travel across from one electrode to the other. It is important that electrons or other ions are unable to pass through to prevent the direct redox reaction which is crucial to avoid thermal energy being produced instead of electrical energy. And secondly, it's important that no other ions can pass through so that there won't be any potential side reactions which may disrupt or interfere with the overall cell reaction. Other than the proton exchange membrane, other common electrolytes include phosphoric acid and potassium hydroxide. As you can see from the overall equation, the only products formed from this redox reaction is water vapour and heat. As a result, hydrogen fuel cells does not produce greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or other air pollutants compared to traditional combustion engines. If the hydrogen pumped into the fuel cell was derived from a renewable energy source, it can be regarded as a zero emission device. In reality, most of the hydrogen we use as fuel is derived from fossil fuels where it would have been refined in a process known as steam reforming which is summarised by the following chemical equations. This process ultimately results in the emissions of carbon dioxide, hence fuel cells cannot truly be labelled as a zero emission device. However, this process is still regarded as a cleaner method overall compared to combustion engines and thermal power plants due to the higher efficiency. What makes the fuel cell more efficient compared to thermal power plant stations is because the chemical energy is directly converted into electrical energy. Hence there's only one energy transformation taking place. In contrast, many different types of energy transformations are taking place in order to produce electricity in a power plant, thus reducing the efficiency as a small amount of energy is lost when energy transitions from one form to the next. We can also explain the high efficiency of fuel cells due to its design. Fuel cells contain carbon electrodes that are porous, which increases the surface area, 
thereby increasing the rate at which the reactants can either lose or gain electrons. Additionally, the porous electrodes also helps the gaseous reactants reach the catalyst layer where the reaction takes place. Platinum is a common catalyst that is coated along each electrode to further increase the rate of reaction occurring within the fuel cell. As a result, the catalyst helps increase the amount of electron transfer and thus the overall current output. Although fuel cells are highly efficient and produce relatively clean energy compared to traditional means, they have limited uses and are not widespread yet. They are typically used to power transportation vehicles such as buses and submarines, primarily used as a backup generator to keep critical facilities like hospitals and hotels working in case of blackouts or other emergencies, and they are also used in spacecrafts like shuttles. The next thing that I would like to discuss are the advantages and disadvantages of fuel cells as a source of energy. The main advantages of fuel cells will be that they have a high energy conversion efficiency, which means that a small amount of energy is lost when energy is converted. It also results in less chemical pollutions compared to thermal power plants that uses fossil fuels. There's also a lot of flexibility in the type of fuel used. In this video, we mainly looked at hydrogen as a fuel, but you could also use methane or methanol as another fuel source. The energy transformations occur within a fuel cell is quiet and doesn't need to be recharged nor do they cost a lot to run the actual fuel cell, and we could actually indefinitely produce electricity as long as we receive a constant supply of fuel. Even though fuel cells have low running cost, they are expensive to produce primarily due to cost with purchasing the platinum catalyst. Another limitation with fuel cells would be that it does require a reliable and continuous supply of fuel. In conjunction, hydrogen gas is extremely flammable, thus distributing, storing, transporting and supplying the fuel carries risk which may thereby incur additional costs for safety measures. Lastly, another limitation with fuel cells is that it produces direct current and is unable to produce alternating current. On the next slide, I've got a table that conveniently summarizes the differences between a fuel cell and a galvanic cell. I would encourage you to thoroughly study the contents on this table as you're typically asked questions that ask you to compare the similarities and differences between fuel cells and a primary cell or a secondary cell. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to please answer the following questions to test for your understanding. Please pause this video now and have a go. In this question, we want to select the true statements about both fuel cells and rechargeable cells. Part A of this question is going to be incorrect because we know that fuel cells require reactants to be continually supplied into the actual cell, so A is out of question. Part B of this question is also incorrect because in a secondary cell when it's recharging, we need the products to remain there in order for the reverse reaction to occur. So B is also incorrect. We could also eliminate option D because we know that fuel cells do not have the capacity to recharge at all. As a result, C is going to be the correct answer. Have a go with another question. In this question, it wants you to identify which of the following is not a feature of a modern fuel cell. If you answered this question correctly, you would have said B is the correct answer. For the next question, I want you to have a go to see if you could describe the similarities and differences between a fuel cell and other galvanic cells without referring to your notes. Give yourself about 3 minutes and then we can compare our answer. If you answered this correctly, you should have got an answer that's very similar to my answer. By now, you should be able to address all the success criteria in the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys again in the next one. Bye.